how do you how do you make the most of the money that you have, and how do you keep the most? How do you be an informed consumer? And understanding that they make money here, they make money in, in the F and I department. Um, understanding that, and being prepared for that when you go in is is really critical. Again, I would make it perfectly clear: the best thing, in my opinion, to do is get pre-qualified and pre-approved for a loan through your credit union for whatever amount you're comfortable spending and, and make sure that that payment fits within whatever your budget is. Um, by the way, here's some of the ways that money is made in this department. Financing, they might add two to two and a half percent. So when they, when, when you fill out the application or they get your, your information, your name, address, social security, <coughs> and so on, it gets sent out into the ethos and they'll get replies back from maybe five, six, 10, could be 15 different finance agencies. It might be Ford Motor Credit or Chevy Credit, Toyota Credit. It could be, um, uh, gosh, give me some uh, that you remember using. Uh, as far as, well, I actually was in the sales, so I wasn't okay. in finance. Okay. So, you know, uh, I mean, there, you're right, there's a whole plethora. There's, they'll go through like BMO Hair Spain. Most national banks, they're going to try and end it up first before your local banks. Right. So what happens is these, these very, very large pools of money come about because they're our deposits. Right? I mean, uh, America is, is keeping their deposits in a, in a savings account at local banks. That money is then turned around and loaned out on cars and mortgages and credit cards and whatnot. So they pay us a half a percent or, if we're lucky, one percent. And they loan it out at 6, 7, 9, 10, 12%. Uh, so what happens is when the dealership gets this sheet back and says, oh, we'll give Joe Consumer a loan at 5.9%, they may come back and say, you know, we can do this at 7.9%. They might make a couple points spread on the deal, and that's where some of the money is made. At your credit, you need to know exactly what it is. And what are auto loan rates right now, you guys? Start at one point Okay, it's about free money. Then we have things like gap insurance. Gap insurance kicks in if you buy a brand new car, you wreck it six months in, and the car is actually worth less than what you paid for it based on the, the book value. Because Which is always going to be the case. Always. Anytime you pull off that light, you're going to lose. I mean, it's depreciated. It's a depreciating asset. Yep. So what, 20 30% probably? Well, it varies, but uh, yeah, it's a good chunk. Mm -hmm. I so think gap insurance is a smart move. So gap insurance, they might make 300 bucks on that. Uh, that's available at the dealership, but it's also available through your credit union. And, and it's not going to be marked up as high as what it is at the dealership. Same thing with things like uh, extended warranty. Uh, my wife and I bought a, a minivan at a Toyota dealership, and I did not know, I was not savvy enough to know, I could buy an extended warranty through my credit union. I think we paid $1,800 for, for an extended warranty, and in hindsight, we probably paid way too much. Um, Things like undercoating, rust proofing, pinstriping, fabric protection, you know, all of these different things are just add-ons. And they obviously don't cost what we're being charged for them. So these are these are things to, to keep in mind. Little bitty things like this add up. So you can do it one of two ways. You can either roll it into your financing, and what happens then is you end up paying even more for that thing because a five hundred dollar undercoat rolled into your loan might end up costing $1,000 by the time you get your car paid off. Or you can just write a check for some of these things at the time of sale and not have it rolled into your financing and you're paying what you pay for it. So just keep in mind there are ways to do that and other ways for them to make more money. What was the difference? What is LoJack? LoJack is a locating uh, device that's put in your car. So if your car's ever stolen, they can track it. It's sort of like find my phone on your iPhone. Really? Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, tracking device. Little computer chip. Yeah. So are all of those things that... applicable to just new cars? No, no. You, they'll, they'll stick them on anything, but they can. Really? Now, out of curiosity, what's the price difference for like undercoating uh, a dealership versus aftermarket? You go somewhere else and have it done. I had it quoted not too long ago for my truck, and it was like $250. 250 no. bucks, okay. both, either or? Dealership versus private. The dealership usually going to pump it up a little bit. So but private, private was too good. Okay. So I've always was told dealers sometimes are a little bit more expensive than if you went aftermarket. Yeah, yeah that's or true. Like a stereo. You, you get at the dealer, it's expensive. You go down to Best Buy, they can give you the same deal puppy for a lot cheaper. Yeah. yeah. That's very true. 
Um, my father-in-law is a, a master <coughs> GM mechanic at a, at a uh, dealership in Cedar Rapids. And, you know, what I didn't realize about that industry until he educated me about it is that even, even in the mechanic <coughs> shop, if, if they're doing a uh, suspension issue, they, they know in the computer that this suspension job is going to take four and a half hours of work. Even if it takes them two, they get paid for four and a half and, and you're billed for four and a half. So it's, it pays to, for these mechanics to be really quick and efficient about what they do because they might, they might be able to bill 60 hours of work in a 40-hour week. And so, again, you have to understand that when you're dealing with dealerships, there is a serious amount of overhead, and the overhead comes in paying the mechanics in the building, and uh, they've obviously got to finance the cars that are on their lot to sell you as well. So there's, there's just a lot of expense that goes into it. That's but again, you find a good mechanic that's not... <laughs> you find with somebody local. Mm -hmm. So the trick, obviously I mentioned it, get qualified at the credit union first. Um, and this is the key no matter what. And it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't matter. We're talking about cars, but it doesn't matter if it's your home, you know, if you want to do a refi, you're buying a new home, or if it's a credit card and you're going to apply for a new credit card. The key is look close to home first. Look at the credit union. Um, trap number two is payment shopping. So... The question will always be asked, what would you like your payment to be? And this is sort of the ace in the hole question that's asked by most salespeople and F&I people is that if I can figure out how to, how to you know, manage this payment, massage a payment into your range, you, know, you may be thinking, well, I, I know I can afford $200 a month, and I'm thinking, you're buying a $30,000 car, so I can do $200 a month, we'll just finance it for... 10 years from now, you know? And in all honesty, there are loans out there now, there are car loans that are going eight, nine, and 10 years in amortization tables. So by the time you've driven, assuming that someone drives 12,000 miles a year, you know, you drive 10 years, that's 120,000 miles on a car, there is nothing left in that car. Uh, you might trade it in for a couple thousand bucks, 3,000 bucks, something like that, depending on the, the type. But these really fancy high-end, calculators that they use, these financial calculators, they're very uh, efficient at factoring in, oh, you want your payment to be this? Well, then I know we have to stretch it to that in terms of number of months. So understand that if you want your payment to be a certain amount and they can make that possible, that you'll end up paying a higher overall price because of the interest rate and the amortization and how long it's going to last. Um, you most likely will never have equity in your vehicle because if you extend the payments out a very, very long time, as Doug mentioned, <coughs> driving around a depreciating asset. So most 20-somethings believe that their car is their greatest asset, and then they realize about 10 years later that they've driven all the equity out of it, there really wasn't any to begin with. And when you go to trade up, the issue with equity is if you're trading in your vehicle and you owe more than it's worth, now all of a sudden you're rolling that extra amount into the next loan and then paying even more for the next car purchase. Does that make sense? So the key is, if we can manage this where we have equity in our vehicle right from the beginning, you know, obviously it won't be a problem. A horror story here that I'm going to share, and y'all probably have one of your own. Um, several years ago, I uh, ran into a kid at Best Buy, and, and he was talking about this new car that he got. And this guy could not have been more than 17 or 18 years old, but he was trying to sell me a car stereo. And he said, oh, I have this one in my car. I got this brand new car. I put this new stereo in. And I said, what kind of car did you buy? Because I'm thinking in my mind, you work at Best Buy. Um, and, you know, we're probably making, what, 10 bucks an hour, 12 bucks an hour, but he's a high school kid, recent graduate. And he's like, well, I got this really cool Honda, and, you know, and I said, and I, I had owned one, and I knew what payments were on new Hondas. My wife had driven one for a while. And I said, man, that's a nice car. I mean, your payment's got to be at least, like, four or $500, right? He goes, no, 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 $200 a month. And I said, uh, just out of curiosity, how much is your insurance? Because you're a 17-year-old guy, you know? 17-year-old males have super high insurance. He said, well, that's kind of the killer. My insurance per month is like $275 a month. So his insurance was more than the car payment. He obviously had no equity in the car, wouldn't, as long as he had the car. And the biggest kicker was, I said, uh, what are you, you going to do? Are you, do you work at Best Buy full-time? Are you going to go on to college? He's like, well... Because of my car, I, I don't know that I'll be able to afford college, so I'm just going to keep working here. And, you know, we make these decisions sometimes, and we make them based on what our immediate desires are, but it doesn't really make sense financially. And so that's the key, how we make this make sense financially. The trick here is 
calculate your car budget, do your homework. So understand again, what are you gonna pay? Not only in uh, for, the, for the payment per month, for your insurance, for registration. And this is one of those things that kind of bites people. Sometimes they buy a car and when it says tax title license not included, then they get out and they go, wait a minute, I owe $2,500 between these three things. I don't have that kind of money. I can't finance it. So do your homework and calculate the potential payments. Calculate what it's all going to be wrapped up into one. Um, you know, I've got some people that will say, oh, I bought this $40,000 hybrid because I'm going to save money in gas. And then in the end, they realize they actually aren't really saving anything because of the car payment is higher than they would have had on something used that maybe didn't take much of the gas mileage. So just understand ahead of time, do all your homework prior to. Trap number three is negotiation. How many of you consider yourself super savvy negotiators? Good, all right. You do? It's, it's something. Okay. Yeah, this would be one of them. Oh, good. So you just tell your husband to keep his trap shut when you go uh, and negotiate? No, I, we actually had, this works really well for us. Uh, we actually have my husband goes and searches. And then he tells them, without my wife's approval, we're not getting the vehicle. And I actually had, a, I brought a, uh, my dream, well, okay, so I have two dream cars. My dream car, a little red Fiat, uh, Spider, Speederina, Convertible. Nice. And the guy said to me, and my husband said, she's only willing to pay this amount of money. He thought we were like doing something in between. And when I went and got it for the price I wanted, he said, really, you would have went more, right? That was your husband doing that. And I said, oh, no, that was me doing that. <laughs> and so it's always been, yes, we really like the car, but without my wife's approval, we're not getting it. And that just mm -hmm. like, what? So, Very good. Was, and you go separately to do yes. this. Yes. He goes first, and then I come in and, and go, Okay, interesting. Very good. Without smiling? Without smiling, you know, like, I don't know, I'm going to have this. <laughs> so, here's what you're going to hear. Doug, did you ever say this? This is the best I can do? <laughs> About, it's the best, this is the best I can do? Yeah. Yeah. And, and was it always the truth? <laughs> <laughs> so, understand that... Car salespeople do this for a living. They understand negotiation. They're very good at it. Uh, if you did something day in, day out, every day, you'd be really good at it as well. Uh, they count on lack of preparation. Most people coming in not really knowing uh, what this car is worth or what it's worth down the street or what they could, you know, what the Kelly Blue Book value says or whatever, you know, whatever the, the things may be. The goal is to throw you off, and they're throwing you off by asking you the questions about what do you want your payment to be and you know, we're refocusing on something other than the price or the negotiation of the, the car. And again, painting with a very broad brush, not all dealerships do this, but they're going to keep you there until you'll agree to anything to leave. And this is where we keep coming back, going, well, i got to talk to my manager about this. And they walk away, and they come back, and we do a little more talking, and we go back, and do some more talking, and come back. You know, there have been situations where, and typically this tactic is used more in... Um, timeshare sales than any other sales engine, but if you're in a timeshare sales presentation and they keep you there for hours and hours, you will literally agree to just about anything to get yourself out of there. Uh, this is a negotiation strategy. Coming. Um, what, what is the deal where they tell you take the car home and keep it over the weekend? They want you to fall in love with that car and come back Take ownership of it. Yeah. So can I just keep doing that and not yeah. actually buy the car? <laughs> <laughs> you were the dealer. Yeah, like, I don't know that I like this one. I, can I try that one over yeah. there? Yeah. Can I try that one for a couple of days? There is a line. 